how their muscles are functioning, what their um, muscle quotients are, what their, um, their inner workings of their cells are. And, and we do that in the office. And now with our collaborative, we're able to bring that to you guys on a multimodality specialty where we can look at things like micronutrient testing. One of the things we do is we'll draw your blood and we'll culture those cells. And from those cells, we'll look at a lot of different micronutrients that are essential for our ability to signal in the cells, to signal in our, our muscle mass, our sarcomeres, to say, hey, it's time to pull harder, or it's time to function better, or it's time to receive um, the responses from the brain more quickly. And if we're deficient in a lot of micronutrients, we won't be able to respond well. Further, if we're training them, they may not recover as quickly. And we like to say, yes, we'll go ahead and, and fix this through proper diet and nutrition. How many of you here are eating a proper diet and nutrition? Okay, so good, right there. Few of you that are, excellent. Um, the rest of them are not. And unfortunately, we have to look at our population and the people that um, are golfers, our clients, or our patients and say, that, all right, I, I got 10% really well. But when you look at people's function and their recovery, this plays a big role. So these are one of the tests that we do um, to look at our blood cells and use that as a rough estimate. Because we don't muscle biopsy people at, at Greenwich Time on sports <laughs> lab. We don't do that. So instead we have to look at the lymph tests. And these give us some borderline or deficient um, functions, which we then will go ahead and replace. Or if you like working with your doctor or with someone else who can replace those things, whatever state you're from, um, we give you a little package and say, these are the following metrics that need to be had. Maybe you need an IV hydration therapy. <coughs> Maybe you need a radical shift in your diet with some supplements or um, even just simple things like juices or just eating the proper foods to be able to improve yourself in things like chromium or manganese or magnesium. One of the other things we like to look at because um, I like to use this as a guide of how well you're aging is something called telomere testing, right? So I think you've sure everyone's heard of it before or the name, if you haven't, all you have to do is turn on Dr. Oz, you know, talk about telomere testing and these sorts of things. It's a useful tool to let me know how well the cells in your body are functioning, how they are aging. And it gives us a benchmark. And we can repair some of this stuff by changing diet, by increasing activity, by training better. We can say, oh, look, the test is better this year over year. And we use that as a benchmark to, to guide and, and help train people. Right? And then I'm certain almost all of you had heard about this because many of you have come and talked to Ali or Mike about hormonal issues. We know about andropause. We do have some concern regarding testosterone and its effective use such that it is not harmful. We know this kind of backlash happened with estrogen and women. We knew that a certain amount of estrogen helped function, it helped prevent dementia, and helped reduce heart disease. Well, it also helped them with recovery. The same is true in men with testosterone at certain levels. And so we look at testosterone, but we don't just look at testosterone by itself alone where, you know, um, sometimes the urologist may be focused on that system. We look more in your hypothalamic pituitary axis, which stems from above your pituitary gland, your master gland, and then goes through your adrenals and your thyroid and the rest of your body, because all these hormones function together. And to get optimal hormone balance, such that you're not losing muscle mass, that you're actually recovering, that you're in a more anabolic phase for people who are exercising. Or if you were overweight and sedentary, that you're more in a catabolic phase so we can burn fat from you and, and help you um, maximize uh, outcomes and recovery. And so that's some of the things that we do. In addition to that, we like to get a little bit fancy and uh, look at performance of the higher end individuals. And we do that through a, a few tests, including tracking lactate thresholds, looking at VO2 maxes and resting metabolic rate. We, we do that as, again, benchmarks to see how we can optimize the, the athletes. You know, space of open more and more pros are feeling more and more athletic and wanting to get to that next level. So we're here to really put that together. We look at your macronutrients. Allie does a great job looking at diet and dietary changes and guidance and seeing how changing a diet can change your hormonal expression. 
can change your risk in that model, right? And, and can change your performance. So again, we talk about body composition and, and function. And we put that all together. And one of the things that we really, really want like to know is how, what's the quality of that muscle? What's the strength of that muscle? What's the likelihood that it's going to recover? How can we begin to burn fat in your body and transform your metabolism? Now we can talk a little bit about these sorts of things that she does to be able to call them. Um, do you guys know what the functional movement screen is? Some of you are trainers in here, some of you have been through the assessment protocol with me. Uh, but I also combine it with muscle activation techniques, uh, which is another additional system of checks and balances that really allows you to pinpoint not only what muscles are weak in the body, but what fibers in the muscle are weak in the body. Because in golf, your glutes, we would say, are one of the most important muscles in the golf swing. However, I, I'm able to tell which fiber of what part of your glute is affecting your internal hip rotation on your downswing, because having that an impact is really huge. Um, and being able to fix it and kind of see the body from a different perspective versus a lot of the times I hear it's really tight to have to stretch. Many of you guys know I'm kind of a contrarian in the sense that I don't stretch, I don't advocate stretching or static stretching, um, and more stabilization, which in turn will allow the body to increase range of motion because your nervous system controls everything. And your hamstrings may be tight because something in your pelvis is weak, and your hamstrings are holding on for dear life to stabilize your pelvis. So stretching them kind of sends a message to your nervous system, whoa, what are you doing? And it'll feel good, but it'll go right back to the length that it was. So muscle activation is actually tightening the loose muscles versus loosening the tight muscles, if that makes sense. So the muscles will be weak and kind of on slack and functioning at maybe 30% of what they should be, and the rest of the body is compensating. So instead of having you know, a table that's a solid table, it has four legs, picture one of the legs half broken, you want to tighten that fourth leg. You don't want to loosen it even more, because then that'll make the body more susceptible to injury. So this evaluation whole process takes me about two hours, and I can really get deep into what exactly is going on compared to what somebody's doing performance-wise or in their golf swings. Specifically, you know, I don't get enough torso rotation in my backswing, or I slide out, I spin out, my foot spins out at impact, I'm hanging back, I'm early extending, all those things. Okay, which fibers and what is really going on deep within those stabilizers that is affecting you that way? So that's really what I do. So again, we we'll just talked a little bit about resting metabolic rates and making sure that people are fueling their bodies right. Right, you, you want to make sure that they're eating not just enough calories, but the right calories as well. And Allie does more than just muscle activation stuff. She handles really all of that kind of dietary planning. And again, we talk about our higher performance <coughs> athletes and golfers have interested in things like the VO2 max and serve as a benchmark for their training. And I said before that um, <coughs> try supplements, we may try diet, but there are just some people who have difficulty absorbing certain things like B12 or, or even uh, chromium, and it, it may go in the liver for first pass impact metabolism, and it just doesn't get to their bloodstream at the appropriate levels. And so for those reasons, we do a lot of things with uh, intermediate nutrient therapy as well. Okay. Um, so we wanted to address a little bit about TRT here, because many of you have asked Allie and Mike regarding this. So, how many people have heard of testosterone replacement therapy before? Right? Up there. right? I, I, I've never been asked. I mean, yeah, haven't you heard the low T commercial? Maybe it's low T, and then the guy with the roses, here you go, right? He's going to be wanting to for roses. Um, right? You know? So, um, I get this every day in my office and in my practice, and, and this is why we're able to bring some of this stuff to Brunch Shot Out. Lab. Testosterone is so essential 
for male function, vitality, muscle mass, as well as metabolism. And so we'll go over a little bit. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time here to ask questions and can guide and go through it and tell you what my philosophy is. Um, this is really the nuts and bolts of how we do this. So TRT, testosterone replacement therapy. Great for testosterone flow. What do I do? One of the first things I do is to make sure they're loose and hamstrings and quads are strong, right? <laughs> make sure that they're not sarcopenic um, and you ask them if they're trained. And then the next thing I do is I wonder why is their testosterone low? You can have a whole host of different reasons for their testosterone as well. And you, one of those that may surprise a lot of you is when you have a baby, the men's testosterone tends to plummet, right? That's a natural kind of selection thing, right? You, let that go in so we can help kind of raise the baby a little bit and then go back on it in a very way. Um, so we see that a lot of times. One of the first things I said was, do you have a new baby? Well, absolutely I did. We can see men's testosterone, their total testosterone dropped by 500 points. Yeah, that's no joke. 900 to 400. A guy's going to feel that. And what they've described it as is like a male postpartum depression sort of thing. They've linked it all to the fact that your testosterone so we look at that. We look at the dietary factors. There are a whole host of different um, things with eating out of boxes and bags and um, gonadal disruptors that will drop your testosterone. Are you eating out of boxes and bags a lot? You uh, process foods a lot. So one of the first things you can do there is peel them off of that, get them on more natural food. Unfortunately, there are some times when it's just so physiologically low that you need to at least get them back to something. You know, my, uh, and besides, my brother-in-law, who runs an auto body shop in Northern Westchester, would come over for dinner at night, and just flop out on the couch, and he's like, that. Ah, it's worked that hard, what's going on? And so he had recurrent sinus problems. And so what we did was we got him to see the ENT doctor, did a CT scan of his, um, of his sinuses, and found that he had a pituitary problem. We checked his testosterone level was non-existent. This sort of made sense with him. He couldn't do anything. He was blue. He couldn't function properly. All he could do to just get out of the work yet with him. And I'm certain that there are golfers in here that you guys have taken care of or, or clients to train who have some of the same things. Listen, I'm trying the best I can. I can't build it. And testosterone is one of the things that is a big issue. So we try and restore it to normal physiology. And so this is very, very important. We're not looking to get someone's total testosterone to 2,000. We are not looking to replace testosterone for Viagra. There's erectile dysfunction. There's a lot of things going on, not just a testosterone level thing. And that is a whole number of evaluation. And Kurt Fisher, I'm not sure, right? <laughs> so we're not looking for this, right? And actually, what I describe to people as something called um, uh, hypertrophic heart, right, cardiomyopathy, I say that imagine if this guy were going to try and fall, right? It would be extremely, <laughs> exceedingly difficult for him. And that's like a hypertrophic heart. Instead, what we're looking for is more functional movement, more lean, tight, dense muscle mass here, right? The guy in the middle is the same guy. Yeah, the same guy. Yeah. And so that's what testosterone can do, guys, right? So you will absolutely bulk up on this sort of stuff. But what we want is quality muscle mass. We don't want that other thing. So we like to screen, and all of our all of our male patients are hypogonadism, right? What's that? That's low testosterone, low free testosterone, or you're having a difficulty centrally in your brain with the same sort of pituitary problems, and you're just not releasing signals for you to make them up to them. So I think I went through a little bit of the symptomatology. The lack of recovery, fatigue, loss of muscle mass, you're starting to gain more fat, you're not able to recover after your workouts as much, you have inflammation, depression, and everything in the world, right? And it, it, I think they call this midlife crisis. <laughs> they call it that, right? So um, that's one of the things you got to check out. And so we do a screening and a questionnaire and also lab work to find out. Michael will be able to give you the slides as well, so you guys can take this home. Right. 
right? Remember, not building muscle mass is not the end all be all of testosterone therapy. <laughs> we want people to be a little bit more functional. We want them to recover great, right? So Mike will go over a little bit of so we can just go through these much. Right? So these are some of the tests that we do at Grand Star Diagnostic Sports Lab. And again, Mike will give you all of this. Maybe you have some of these levels. Maybe your doctor has already tested you for some of these things if there's issues or your clients. And so I'm okay with probably um, at least not yet. And so these are the different ways that we measure testosterone. We look at total free and bioavailable testosterone. Not all labs will really be able to get a bioavailable out. So you have to order some specialty testing. I know Quest has a specialty lab that will do this. SpectraCell, one of the labs that we use, also is able to get bioavailable testosterone. And again, I go back to the fact that laboratory reference values are all over the place. They're just based on a nomogram of your 70 kilogram male sampled in a certain region where they were sampled. Everyone is different. Our metabolism is different. Well, yeah. Are all testosterone um, uh, doctors who test for testosterone levels and their ability to um, assess and prescribe, are they the same? So you really don't get there are lots of different types of doctors, right, that, that would test the testosterone. It may be an endocrinologist, it may be an internist, in fact, it may even be a pediatrician, it may be a urologist that does these sorts of things as well, or a cardiologist. All of them get widely different training, which is why it's important when you talk to the doctor about it to really feel comfortable. Some guy may, a patient may just come to my office and say, Hey, I feel fatigued. You answer positive to the screening questionnaire and you test them. It looks great. I can understand total and free and sexual and body globulins. Make sure that their, their glutenizing hormone is appropriate. Measure testicular volumes on them to make sure those are okay. Not all doctors would do that. And that's because we didn't really learn a lot about this in medical school. And only a small amount of it in our residency training. And so it requires additional training and, and um, review to be able to. And you've had that trend. Yep, absolutely. And evolution never prescribed testosterone. People just got old. Correct. So, so tell me a little bit about. I think I want to okay. revisit, which is okay. a good point. Remember when I said diet plays a role in testosterone levels? Mm -hmm. We're eating things with all sorts of chemicals in them that are androgen disruptors that um, chemically won't cause disease. Right? So the FDA is okay with them in our food, but they will cause endocrine disruption. And there's a whole host of those, whether it's in your boxes or bags of food. And we found abnormally elevated levels of a few of these in, in just the bags, right? Like the frito legs bag, Doritos in there, and just from the lining and the inside of that to keep it fresh. Some of these chemicals will actually disrupt that. And Mike can give you a good handout some of those hormonal disruptors that we have. And so evolution did not introduce free life. They did not introduce cinema. They did not break. And so these environmental triggers that we are now getting on that our body has to respond to are really adapting, and that's part of the problem. Whereas I said, a man drop, can drop his testosterone post baby. That's evolutionary, right? However, someone who is um, 50 pounds or 40 pounds overweight and causing an adiposopathy which is where your fat cells are sick and preventing the testosterone, may not have been the case for a lot of years, but the caveman was starving up until a relative excess over the last few months. So age has nothing to do with lower We certainly do see a decline over time in men's ability to produce testosterone. And their ability to handle things such as testosterone therapy, and those guidelines do have to be adjusted based on age and uh, medical status. So. The reference range may be different for 70-year-old man versus 20-year-old man, but they're also very widely. And so because of that, we have to rely on the clinical complaints of that patient. And we do that through uh, biological opinions to look at muscle mass. We do that through other levels, other hormonal things, as well as other metabolism things, as well as their complaints. And those things really matter. <coughs> A lot of times, it's not a complaint. And there actually is something going on. Right? And so that you, you don't need to worry about this. This is the different ways you can try. Right? And again, estradiol. So
so many people do estradiol testing is really the gold standard in 24 hour urine. Um, so many labs do not do a good job of assessing this. Estradiol matters for patients that are on TRT because you do get conversion and you need to make sure that um, you're not defeating yourself. And we see this more with transdermals than we actually do with uh, either intradermal or intramuscular testosterone death on. And um, the, the aroma symptom, the different hormones that convert tend to be more active with our transdermal testosterone. Yes? So just a question back to testosterone. Is there a, a theoretical difficulty with the, the uh, TRT uh, as far as your liver is concerned? Right, so there are many things we need to follow and watch, and liver is one of those sets of levels that we watch and make sure that we don't have teleosis hepatis, which is um, kind of cyst-like creations in the liver that usually you see that with very, very, very high testosterone, people that are using a lot of rinse from all, they're using a lot of not medically prescribed testosterone, but we do like to watch that and watch liver levels. That's why it's important to kind of monitor this accordingly. You first and then. Yeah. The, uh Testosterone supplements have any value? Oh, right. So you, you, you're talking about these analogs, like a rod hat, or are you talking more about like I take uh, DHEA or yeah. certain things? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great. Yeah. Why don't you guys talk a little bit about that? Before I got back in the golf industry, uh, I was part of the company that was making a lot of those, and I can tell you firsthand that they do more harm than good most of the over the counter stuff because you don't have a clinical. Person like Dr. Murphy or somebody for your doctor prescribing it and seeing what's going to actually happen. Most of the time, you leave that product worse than you were uh, before. You might get a little pickup, but then your body now um, creates a negative feedback loop and the body starts demanding it and you just shut everything else down. So I know it happened to me. That, that's one of the worst things that you do, do is get something close to the actual thing. It's not tracking it, it's kind of yeah. I just want to ask about the relationship between estrogen and testosterone in men. As, as estrogen increases, does testosterone decrease? What, what is that? Sort of, right? I so mean, they're, um, their signaling system for luteinizing hormone can be suppressed accordingly. So uh, they both have feedback loops that talk to our pituitary and can diminish the amount of, um, of, of luteinizing hormone. Right, uh, of LH that can then say, oh, I don't need to do this, I don't think the testing will that use. So we tend to watch that a little bit, right? And that's why we like to do 24 hour for, uh, for our aspirin. So are you reestablishing a neural connection to your testicles? And after a while, you'll not need that treatment anymore? Right, so some people actually don't need that treatment once you actually set that in. Regardless of the range. Well, I, I think that's a bigger statement to say. I can't say that. Okay. But I can say that a lot of people that we have on this therapy to kind of wake up that system are able to take it off. And what I mean a lot, I'd say about 30%. But there must be some age related. Well, sure there is, uh, right? Remember, there's, right, so there, there's age will cause a decline. Whether that decline is steep, whether that decline is shallow is not so much evolutionarily based, it's environmentally based. Okay. And so we have to modify the environment, help get them back into the bandwidth of where we would expect them, normal or physiologically. And in this case, it's to treat for patients or for the golfers and plane source in the home. Just yeah. want to follow up on that. As estrogen levels rise, and I, as I understand it, all the plastics and all the packaging and, you know, uh, even receipts, the, the little uh, paper receipts, they're increasing estrogen counts in men. Is this, the, is this a, a significant reason for increased testosterone levels in men? So the answer is that's the concern, the public health concern, and that's why there's a lot of study going into this right now. Part of it is really scientific, but it doesn't mean the medical standards to say, all right, we need to eliminate all of these things, yeah, remember the, um, there is evidence for that, but it's not high enough for the government or any other um, board to start cutting the stuff out of our body yet. But there are a percentage of patients who, when they start to have these things, they feel it. They come to us, they complain, they have issues, and those need to be redirected. And 
one of the things, like I said, we do is a big environmental screen to see what would be affecting these homes. Right. So that's another thing, is compliance, right? When we set up a, and I set up a protocol for people for, their, for testosterone replacement therapy, they have to be on reasonable schedule. They have to stick to dietary changes. They have to stick to activity changes. It's the only way we're going to get the best um, sort of outcome. And when we check those as well, we try to make sure we check them at the same time. And in the end, it is that's common sense, right? Don't, the whole thing is just simple common sense, working with a clinician to be able to establish and get you to the right level, feeling better. And, and now, <laughs> James, uh, yeah, James. Just saying. So, all right. So, we can to skip the rest of the point. I think Alan wants to mention how.
would not get out of bed, had to work out at 9 o'clock at night. And he's 32, that's my age. He shouldn't be living that lifestyle at that age, no matter if any age, actually. And so after getting that blood work done and his testosterone was really low, other doctors he had seen said it's in range. And like Dr. Murphy said, the range is huge. So you can be in range, but if you're 32 and you're at the very low end of the range, that's not right. So. Um, we had to fix his cortisol, which was cut some coffee, put him on more aerobic work, less high intensity, basic strength training, um, and then get his blood work monitored. He went on TRT, and he's been on it for, I don't know how long. Well, the best part about it is he's in a good range. Um, these types of patients, again, as I said before, will begin to sort of pulse them down and make sure that their LH and their FSH are appropriately elevated, right, that the hormones will stimulate the, your body to make testosterone. And as those are up and you peel it down, we watch to see if the testosterone will come up on its own. Sometimes we need to give other medications that actually will stimulate luteinizing hormone to get it to wake up at the t same time that we taper down the, uh, the testosterone. No one ever really cuts cold turkey. You really have to taper this down, otherwise it can create an energy. Which gets into what you're talking about, the over-the-counter thing. You know, people just take it and at the end of the day, the bottle comes in, and what do I do? That will really create more issues coming off of it than actually staying on it for a longer time, or how to come off of it. Really, how to come off of it is really good. Dick, and he was, this guy was taking a tribulus and microbead and experimenting with a bunch of that, and some of the bodybuilding stuff. He was self-medicated, right? Yeah. He had problems and issues, so he went to supplements, or whatever else he did, to try and get back, get his game back, get to where he wanted to be. And when really what you need to do is you just need to put all the pieces together and work with an interdisciplinary team. Think about micronutrient deficiencies, think about hormone issues, think about recovery, think about diet, think about environment, and put it all together. That's why I'm really happy to have us together as a team to be able to help your clients, your golfers, to, to really succeed. The other end of that spectrum, I have another guy, member of Metropolis, 72 years old, likes working out, absolutely exhausted, eating zero fat in his diet, a lot of bread. Not overweight, but, you know, some belly fat. His testosterone level is in the 200s. He's walking around now in the 800s for 72-year-old, for 72-year-old, which is phenomenal. Working out four days a week, playing golf every single day, he feels amazing. He'll leave me and go to the gym just to hang out and ride the bike because it feels so good. And I've never seen anybody that age so motivated. And his diet's on point now. He's eating enough healthy fats. So, you know, it, it really happens at any age. But like I said, we do see it a lot younger. So even my guys in the 30s are like, yeah, that doesn't really affect me. But medicating with coffee and supplements sometimes doesn't really solve all the issues. Because I have no idea what to talk about. When you can say drop 70,000, I don't have a clue. The range. Kind of like some people, some of us don't know. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. The yeah. acronym that you're using either LH is luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone comes from our pituitary and it signals our body to make testosterone. Okay? Um, FSH is follicle stimulating hormone and it stimulates our ability to produce sperm. And women, it stimulates estrogen production and ovarian eggs, right, generally. Um, normal testosterone range is anywhere from low 400s to 1100, okay? Now you have to take, you have a lab measurement. The measurements change in different labs and different reference values based on units of 10, micro, nano, milli, Sort of unit. So you always have to watch them. But you expect your clinician to say, oh, oh okay, right. 12 is not really 12, it's really 120. Um, so the, those are a little bit of the variances there in terms of the range. Um, where I would where are we? So these are kind of your different reference levels here, peak grams and nanograms per deciliter, and even the deciliter change that side may change too in the metric system. So we can throw these off. And that's why I really try not to say magic numbers because different labs have they'll, they'll shrink or elevate those ranges. If I can add to that, um, to give you an idea, 
basic general rule that I use for the uh, top members. Um, about a 25 year old guy is in the 7, 8, 900 range. 35, you drop about 400. A teenager going through puberty, about 400, 1400. Uh, bodybuilders in the 70s were in the 14 to 1600 area. Now, those guys, that big guy that we showed, was probably 10,000. So, so, to give you an idea of what the reference is, that 100 milligrams a week to 150 milligrams a week uh, is the normal uh, therapeutic dose, these guys are taking 4,000 milligrams per week. So, I've seen uh, through the gym that high end of this stuff where those guys will think they've got five heads. That's not what we're going after, but to give you the idea of where Where's the safety, safe zone or testosterone? Even that guy who shrunk back down is healthy again. But um, getting back to, to what we're looking for here is getting a person in the higher part of that range for them, wherever their range is, optimal. Minimum 800, which what I like to see with people that I know. Where would I want my friends to be? I want them to be 800. Do I want 10,000? We'll get James to 10,000. But I don't want them under 200. I don't want them under 400. 600, if you're not up there, fine. Especially if you don't have clinical symptoms. Yes. Right? And that's one of the things that we always look back at. That's why we screen and make sure that physiologically they're doing okay. The muscle density is okay. They're not sarcopenic. They don't have other things because no data point rules everything. It's a mix. You hit as far as right with John, but you're hitting every carefully and winning the time. Great, are you getting as far as you Okay. So, that's great. Right. Give me an idea. 275 ounces is good. 320 in the trees is horrible. But, you know, we want to get you to bomb the ball as far as you want. But if you don't, if you're having other symptoms, or you're having the adverse, you know what? Okay. It's not acceptable to be an assistant pro the section hitting a 200 yard bomb. Okay, that's, you guys, you, you laugh. Some of the people in this room are even, you know, hitting at 150 off the tee. And that's a problem when you're in the test level numbers are under 200. Is there any study correlated between testosterone level and <coughs> two footers? <laughs> we, well, we could make one with you. Well, I'll, tell you I'll tell you what, right? When your testosterone is low, your focus is definitely off. Yeah, you can't come. There you go. Another thing. So, so what's all the conversation about heart and testosterone? Right, so just like we had issues with estrogen replacement and increased risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease, we find that we have the same concerns earlier on for testosterone, right? We were giving people and women estrogen forever. I mean, for decades before we started to say, hey, maybe this stuff doesn't do such a good thing. And we do have the exact same concern for testosterone. Testosterone at higher level can cause platelet stickiness, which means that you're more likely to form clots. Clots cause heart attacks and strokes. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, at really elevated levels, you get a dysmetabolic syndrome that also can cause problems with cardiovascular disease and stroke. And lastly, too high a level can lead to inflammation. And that's why it's important to get the blood levels and, and measure a lot of other different measurements with the testosterone to make sure you're in the Seems arduous. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to all this. Seems okay. I gotta go every month and get shot. I gotta get blood tests every other week. Um, I'm not I'm, I'm not well, you see anything. Right. <laughs> so the point the point is it seems arduous. It seems um, um, Righteous in a way, but expensive. My my brain is frying right now with, with all the appointments. Well, I got to go to see Ali. I got to go see. Well, how hard was it to learn golf? Right. I mean, some people are just assholes. Other people really get to put time and work and go and the effort. I get it. Things, right? and, and it's a similar sort of thing if you if you're really looking to optimize things. And again, we are here to set up the plan to work through it. You may have your own guy that you can work through. You just hand off the plan to the work. Um, taking care of yourself and optimizing the body for, for health and performance is probably more important than worrying about your 401k, worrying about sure. you have your retirement next. Okay? 
So I agree with you. That's the problem we as men most have, right? We're like, God, it's a pain in the butt. I mean, I've got this other stuff taken care of. I'm feeling kind of okay. I'll just push through it. How many of us push through it? You hear the story. All right, I'm in. I'll just push through it. Heart attack. Push through it. Stroke. Push through it. Whatever health problem. And that's the problem with, as men that we have to grab. Okay. So that's a good It's fair. So my, my question is this. If, if, um, I have, a, I have a niece who's about 45 years old. I know he's a, you know, a figure. He's got, you know, photosaurus in the brain. Right. So if <clears throat> he talked to you about what you're doing, in general, would he be giving you a lot of pushback, or would he be uh, 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 well, it typically? All, it all depends, right? Um, it really depends, and it depends on what your symptomatology is, right? right? If you were, if you're like, listen, I'm just looking at another like ten yards. Um, <laughs> really, you want to take that risk? But if there are real symptomatologic issues, the interns will be good. I, I'm so busy seeing a lot of other these sick people. I don't want to have to take the time to manage this, but I know I've outsourced it.
especially if it's in capsule form and not tablet form. The capsules, you have to break down that capsule, that plastic part. Your stomach's not going to break it down. It's going to go right through you. So that's why it's so important to understand dietary, you know, uh, dietary issues, what's going on, exploring the entire system, you know, what kind of symptoms do you have, any medications, all those can affect hormones as well. So thank you guys again, I really oh, yeah. appreciate it. We'll see you the Take any cool. questions. Chris, uh, if you were to come and make, a, make an appointment, can the insurance cover any of, any of it? Insurance will cover some of the laboratory testing, and we can write letters of medical necessity for some of it. But a lot of the services are, are out of contract. And it really depends based on your insurer, too. But a lot of our services, um, the expensive stuff, the lab tests, a lot of those we can find here covered. I have a price list for it. Okay, I'm how much of this was ever misdiagnosed as someone going through depression then? All the time. Right? All the time. And it sounds like it's, they're similar symptoms. Absolutely. Right. All yeah. the time. When you test off for an action, yeah. and you're asking to name sometimes. I mean, people say that hormones don't affect mood. And, you know, women go through this every month. And if anybody here who lives with a female going through menstrual, going through the menstrual cycle, you know it fluctuates throughout the month. So, you know, from effect. Well, <laughs> so, it happens all the time, and that's why we have so many people on the DNA depressive medications, too. They, they are completely hormonally disrupted, but rather than go see Dr. X or Y, they went to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, oh, you need all the criteria for depression. Try Wolbutrin. We're very much in favor of replacing what's missing. We want to get you in your range. Whatever your range is, we want you there. We don't want you so low that you're now you're moving in effect. And we want to get the right diagnosis too. Right? That's what your diagnosis is for. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about when when someone has a baby, right? And that lower drops. Yep. Here's what. Like how about like be like puppy? I don't I haven't seen any stuff in the puppy. <laughs> I think it's a, I think, I, honestly, I think it's a really good question. I honestly think it's a really good question, but I you're caring for something, you know, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. I don't know. Craig's question on, uh, you know, you weren't having to be here with our time and reproduce and pretty much die at 35. We really didn't have a hormone waiting for them over here, so we want to make sure that we can now get that healthier and happier. Because, I mean, all the levels of show, as soon as you get the 30 something, it cracks. <laughs> Thanks a lot, right? <laughs> All right. Any other questions? As far as having a baby, you just had one here to say. Here, the differentiation between having a girl versus a boy. No, this study was done, it's just, they didn't control for science. That's going to come up your age. Don't know how much is 13. You got a lot less because you had a girl.